Hi, today I want to talk to you about hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and hypermobile spectrum disorder. The reason I'm talking to you about this today is that May is HEDS and HSD Awareness Month, so I wanted to make a video about my story, how I went from first symptom to receiving that diagnosis, particularly because many people with these conditions do not get diagnosed very quickly because of poor medical awareness, and many people also receive inaccurate diagnoses prior to receiving their correct diagnosis with things like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. My own diagnosis took, so I had my first symptom when I was eight and I was diagnosed when I was 41. So that's, I wanna say 33 years, 33 years to receiving that diagnosis. So before I get started, if you're new here, I make content about autism and chronic illness and disability. So if you like friendly, honest information about autism, disability and chronic illness, then consider subscribing to my channel. So as I say, I had my first symptom when I was eight and my first major symptom was stomach pain. I had significant stomach pain to the point where my mum took me to the doctor and the doctor sent me to a specialist and I saw a paediatrician at the hospital who kind of examined me lots of times and did a scan. I remember there being a scan. And after about six months, they concluded that I had juvenile migraine which was confusing because I wasn't having headaches at that point and it was in my stomach and I thought migraines were headaches. But we accepted that diagnosis because, you know, doctors know best, right? In my early teens, I started to experience other kinds of pain. I experienced the ongoing stomach pain that's basically never gone away, that delightful little symptom that I've lived with for my entire life. But I also started to experience like knee pain and finger pain when I was writing and wrist pain when I was writing became quite bad and fatigue, like significant fatigue. But I didn't really complain to my mom or go to see a doctor because when you're a kid, the thing is, is that you don't know what is and isn't normal. So unless someone specifically told you, your hands and fingers and wrists should not be incredibly painful if you've written for five minutes, then you just think that that's the same for everyone and you're just somehow less good at coping with it. Like I remember thinking about the fatigue, it didn't stop me doing anything because I remember thinking, well, everyone must feel this tired and I mustn't be lazy and give in to it. So that's the thing I think with the symptoms that I had when I was a child and a young teen, I just assumed that that was being alive <laughs> until I got a little bit older and those symptoms got worse. So in my late teens, the stomach pains really stepped up a notch. I remember being at university and having stomach pains that got so bad that I would have to hold onto a counter and kind of <sighs> breathe through them like labor pain essentially, which if you haven't had a baby, it's like a nine out of 10 on the pain scale, I'm not gonna lie. And these pains, these spasms were just as bad. They were incredibly painful, but I think because, because probably because I'm autistic, I just didn't know what to do with symptoms. When I was like young and independent, having just left home on my own, making decisions about whether or not to go and see doctors, I just didn't really feel like there was anything that they could do probably, and that I was probably just being lazy or that I was probably just being mental or that I probably just wasn't eating right or I don't know, I would just explain them away and not see the doctor. So at that point, my pain, my joint pain became worse. I started to have really bad knee pain in both knees but predominantly in my right knee and also shoulder pain and also hip pain and I was dance training at the time so that was a bit of a problem because I needed to be physical so I just kind of bound things up with many many tuba grips and got on with it essentially because again I thought that this was normal this was just dance training this was just being someone who was like a dancer and just had to live with pain as well and my flexibility was really really useful in this scenario I've always been quite bendy and it was really handy being able to easily stretch myself out because I was a dancer and then in my early 20s after I'd finished my dance training but I was still working as a circus artist, one morning I woke up and I couldn't move my head because my neck was so incredibly painful. So I thought that I'd injured it because I was a circus artist and you know, you could, could, could easily injure your neck. I hadn't really done anything other than sleep, but nonetheless, I assumed that I didn't injured it. And it took about three weeks 
and it, and it healed. I guess, well, it didn't heal, but it stopped being so painful and I was able to carry on with my life. But then after that, that neck pain would basically happen to me every, probably every month or two months. And it just basically got worse and worse and worse as the years went on. And I can remember times where we've been camping and we've had to drive home from the campsite so that I can sleep because I've not been able to sleep in the tent because of my neck pain. And I remember once being out with the children when they were really little and my neck hurting so badly that I couldn't cope. It was like, an, again, like a nine out of 10 on the pain scale. And I was kind of driving along with the kids in the back, tears streaming down my eyes. And I drove to the nearest, um, 24 hour accident place, not accident and emergency, the next one down from that because it obviously wasn't an accident or an emergency and I do like to interpret names of things very literally, mm, autism. Anyway, and they had to kind of give me some kind of painkiller injection so that I could carry on functioning as a mother for the day and advise that I get various scans and such like which I've never gotten done. So as I got into my 30s, my neck pain stopped being on just one side and moved on to the other side as well. So now I, when I get the neck pain, it's like basically my entire neck and shoulders, which is delightful. And because I live with it so frequently, it's just a part of my day-to-day -day life. Put on the scarf, use the heat pack, take the painkillers, rub on the ibuprofen gel and get on with it. But it gets worse and worse and worse to the point now where my neck pain can be so bad that I feel frightened that my head is gonna fall off or something. And I know that sounds ridiculous, I really do, but it feels like that and I'm kind of an anxious person. In my 30s, the fatigue started to become really overwhelming. So as well as the joint pain and the gastro pain and now more frequent headaches started to be added into that delightful mix. My fatigue became so overwhelming that I couldn't push through it anymore. Before I would be like, I'm so tired, I could go to sleep right now, but I'm gonna carry on. And it reached the point where I couldn't do that anymore and I had to just stop. And so that was the kind of prompt that pushed me to get some further investigations done. And when I was 33, 34, I'm not entirely 100% sure, around that age, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome because I'd been to see the doctor about these pains and this fatigue and they'd run a whole bunch of blood tests and ruled out all the obvious stuff and started to think I was neurotic because I already had mental health issues and the doctor thought that probably this was just anxiety because if you go to the doctor when you have mental health issues with a physical problem, they will assume that this is just health anxiety even if you've actually broken a bone. Hmm. Anyway, the doctor sent me to the local chronic fatigue syndrome department. They diagnosed me. I did a little course about pacing and I assumed that that was the problem. And I've talked about ME on this channel and I'm not sure whether I actually have it or not, but I believe that my Ehlers-Danlos syndrome diagnosis like supersedes the ME diagnosis because the chronic fatigue is being caused by the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So I think I probably don't have ME, but I'm not 100% sure. So we just kind of keep it on the back burner. Maybe she's also got ME, who knows? Anyway, about two years ago now, two summers ago now, I went to bed for a couple of days because I was really, really tired and couldn't get up for three months. This was a really difficult time because I thought that I had ME and what I needed to do was rest because people with ME need to get a lot, a lot, a lot of rest, like really lots and lots of rest. It really sucks. It's a really sucky diagnosis and my heart goes out to anyone with that diagnosis. So I went to bed and I started resting, but the more I rested, the more my muscles wouldn't work properly and the more my joint pain became severe and the less that I could move and it became this like self-fulfilling vicious circle thing, prophecy thing. <laughs> wow, talk about your mixed metaphors. Anyway, um, I ended up basically bed bound. Like I could c come out into the garden and I did do a few jobs in a wheelchair, but if you saw me around that time, I'm thinking autism show 2018. It wasn't my finest hour. I was in a wheelchair, kind of slumped, giving this talk, basically. That's what my public appearances looked like during that time, and it was really challenging, and, and I started to look for more answers, because what I was experiencing did not seem to fit the pattern for chronic fatigue, and at the time, I also came across Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome for the first time, met other people, because there do seem to be a lot of autistic people with this diagnosis, so I met other people with this diagnosis, and I was, really flexible, experiencing joint pain, easy bruising, stretchy skin, and it just seemed to make sense. So I decided to go to a specialist and I saw Dr. Kaz Kaz, who works at the 
hypermobility clinic in London. I saw her in about January, February of 2019 and she diagnosed me with hypermobile spectrum disorder and I made a whole video about it which you can go and watch if you'd like to know more about the differences between hypermobile spectrum disorder and hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. The reason that I didn't get the EDS diagnosis at that point was that although I fulfilled the majority of the criteria, I didn't get enough ticks in one section, essentially. So I got the HSD diagnosis, which was fine. I didn't really care specifically what the diagnosis was as long as it was useful for moving forward, doing physiotherapy, getting me out of bed, starting to see some progress with my health issues. And then I started to join the dots with my son, Roboboy, who was experiencing joint pain, fatigue, easy bruising, and is extremely bendy. And I had an unfortunately not very helpful experience getting him seen by the NHS, which you can find out more about if you watch the video that we made together after receiving our diagnosis. And so I decided to take him to see a private specialist who would see children because I wanted him to get a diagnosis if that's what the problem was so that moving forward going to secondary school and becoming like older going through puberty he would have the support that he needs and also would be doing the right things medically to not deteriorate in the way that I have because I know that that's important with these conditions. So we went to see Dr Brennan in London at Maybe that was the hypermobility clinic. I'm getting mixed up. Anyway, we saw Dr. Brennan in London. He works on Harley Street, which felt really proper. And I wasn't really expecting anything to happen with me in that appointment, but he pointed out that this meant that I now ticked enough boxes to also receive a diagnosis of HEDS, and that since this was clearly a familial syndrome, as in passed down from me to my child, that meant that it was HEDS and I was diagnosed at the same time as RoboBoy. So I'm not going to get into explaining the diagnostic criteria of HEDS at this point because there are videos already on YouTube where people have done that really well so I would recommend that you go and watch one of those. I will also put a link in the comment box below to the diagnostic criteria so that you can just go ahead and check those out for yourself. So where am I at now with this diagnosis? So it's a problem every day. I'm not going to pretend that like No, that's not what happened. I guess it's a bunch of different factors that come into play. I started doing daily physio in about March of 2019, having seen a physiotherapist briefly, but also because I've got a lot of experience having been a dancer of how to strengthen various parts of the body without overstretching, and with an awareness now that I shouldn't be overstretching. So I do about 15 minutes every morning and I make sure that I get a short walk every day as well because I know that with connective tissue disorders it is important to keep a certain amount of exercise in place so that I don't lose muscle tone uh, because the muscles are basically the thing that are holding my joints in place because the connective tissues are not very good at that. So I do those things and I guess it's a state of mind as well. I guess I've started to accept that I am disabled and use the disabled term more than I used to. I used to think about the time when I would get better. And in some ways that was a positive thing because it kept me going, but in some ways it kind of stopped me from moving forward in my new life because I was always just putting off things until I got better. So some kind of acceptance over that this is the way my body is made and it isn't ever going to go away has been really helpful. I'm definitely not 100% there yet with that work and I might even go as far as seeing a therapist to work through that. And as part of that acceptance, I guess, using mobility aids when I need to. So rather than being stuck at home because I can't walk very far or because my knee hurts or because my hip hurts, I use mobility aids when I need to. I currently own a pair of smart crutches which I use really regularly because my knees and my hips are often quite painful and long term I will be looking at getting some kind of electric wheelchair. I used to have a manual wheelchair but we've actually gotten rid of that because it made me so so very sad when I was using it and completely unable to control anything about the situation whatsoever that I was in. I just got really really stressed by it so we've gotten rid of that and we're looking moving forward to getting some kind of an electric wheelchair when I can afford it. And that will be useful for big long days out or flights when we have to go to the airport or shopping trips or, you know, anything where... Because basically I do this half an hour walk a day and that's it then. No more walking will be able to happen for me. That is my limit. I mean, I stop and have a break even on that walk, basically. So 
If I want to, I can save that half an hour walk for a very short half an hour trip to the shops and not walk the dog, but she gets sad. Poor sad Coco. So I walk Coco and then I need to use mobility aids basically for anything else that I'm gonna do that day. So it's finding that balance of exercise and rest because whenever I try and do more and more exercise, I become really, really fatigued and really, really unwell. But if I don't do enough exercise, I get really, really bad joint pain. And I feel like I'm doing quite well at finding that balance. Additionally, I'm actually just about to see the high mobility specialists at our local hospital, the physiotherapists. So I'm really hoping they might offer me some hydrotherapy because I think that would be delightful and hopefully very useful. So yeah, that's my story. I have always had EDS but I only found out about it last year. Moving forwards, I've made a lot of content about autism and that's brilliant and I'll definitely be continuing to make lots of autism related content, but I'd also like to make some content for those of you with a connective tissue disorder or a physical disability of any kind. So it would be really helpful to me if you'd leave me a comment in the comment box below telling me what kind of content you would like me to make that's more sort of general disability related or connective tissue disorder related. Let me know what kind of content you'd like to see about that, bearing in mind that I am not a medical professional, just someone who tends to go on a lot. Additionally, I have a members only club on YouTube where you get an extra video a month, a free purple Ella sticker, emojis, and all sorts of fabulous things. So if you look at the button where you uh, would subscribe on my channel, next to that there's a join button and if you click on that, it will tell you all about how much it costs and what the perks are. And one of the bonuses of joining that is that it gives me some kind of an income, which means that I can carry on making free videos for everyone to enjoy. So thanks for being here. Don't forget to like this video if you did like it. I mean, like it even if you didn't. It's just a little like button. And I will see you next week. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.